Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name's Donna. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I want to thank... Um, Leanne for inviting me to come and, and share in the, this weekend's convention, and um, I've had a wonderful time. I enjoyed very much listening to Sandy and to Bobby, and uh, it's been great to see friends, people that I know, and um, you know, get to hang out with a bunch of new people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to welcome everybody here this morning. I really appreciate that you're here. Um, welcome to the newcomers, and welcome to all the out-of-town guests. This is great. There's more people here from other places than there are from San Francisco, and that's <laughs> That's nice. Um, it is always a privilege to share in Alcoholics Anonymous in any capacity at all, anything that I'm asked to do here. I owe my life to this program. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and there is nothing that I'm ever asked to do here that, one, that I feel particularly qualified to do, and two, that, I, that would be too much of an inconvenience because, you know, everything I have in my life today I owe to this program. And... Um, uh, to the principles that I've learned to live by one one little day at a time. And so I'm just, you know, it's my privilege to come here and share with you. I just, I have to say for myself, though, you know, uh, I am an AA member, and all I ever want to be is an AA member. I just want to be a little, you know, person taking up a seat in my home group, and, and I want to sponsor people, and I want to go to prisons and jails, and I want to put my hand out, I want to answer the phone, I want to bring the cookies, I want to answer the hotline calls. I mean, that's what being an AA member is about for me. I mean, it is a lifestyle. It's not just something I do sometimes. And um, and I'm just very, very grateful for that. So, you know, before I even start, I just want to say I'm no authority on anything. I know nothing exclusively. Um, I just have my experience, strength, and hope to share with you this morning, and I'm pleased to do that. Uh, my sponsor always says that she... Uh, she always gives these three things and says that these are the things that makes her a member in good standing in Alcoholics Anonymous, and so I believe that, and that's what I do too. My sobriety date is the 5th of May, 1987, and my sponsor's name is Polly P., and she has a sponsor, and my home group is called the Primary Purpose Group. It meets on t Tuesday nights in, P in Palm Desert at 7 o'clock. And it is a, it's a great group. It's a great Alcoholics Anonymous group. It's a, it's a discussion meeting and there's, uh, there's people there that have a lot of time in this program and there's always a lot of newcomers and it's a great interactive group and I'm responsible to those people. I am the, uh, brake monitor there because I can whistle louder than anybody in the, <laughs> and, uh, so it's my talent, you know, that I bring to Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, uh, you know, those are the things that are really important to me, and I'm accountable for those things, and, and those things uh, mean a great deal to me. Um, I am not a California person. I'm from Montana, and I was a sleazy little drunk from Billings, Montana, and Red Lodge, Montana. I did all my drinking in a little cowboy bar town up there called Red Lodge. It's a ski resort place. About 2,000 people. has 14 bars in it. It's uh, it's just a wild and crazy little joint. I was up there this summer. It was I was privileged to you know, speak at a conference up back up in Montana, the Beartooth Mountain Conference, and it was just incredible to go back up there and to walk up and down the streets of that town that I used to live like this pitiful little uh, piece of human garbage, you know. Um, the way I used to live and the woman that I used to be, I had I didn't have choices in those days. Everything in the world affected my life, and it affected my decisions, and it affected the way I did everything. I was a complete victim to whatever happened around me. You know, I had no, nothing, no way to live, no solutions, no answers for myself, no opinions for myself. I was just there, and I just survived, and I survived by alcohol. And I'm, you know, it was wonderful to go back there and walk up and down those streets and to remember that person that used to live here. And just, I had a lot of forgiveness for that person. I just felt like, you know what? I'm no longer angry at myself for the way I used to be. I'm just so extremely grateful that I don't live like that anymore. And I have so much joy in my life. I have an incredible, incredible life. I am, I am uh, deeply happy. Um, I wake up in the morning with a, with a lot of peace. You know, and I'm not saying I don't have character defects and that I don't have struggles, because I do. But generally speaking, when I wake up in the morning, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be who I am today. And when I was living in Red Lodge in those days, I didn't want to be who I was. I wanted to be anybody other than who I was. And, uh, 
you know, I come from an alcoholic home. Uh, this is the, this is my version of what it used to be like is that I come from this alcoholic home and I grew up, I grew up in that house with uh, just a lot of fear and a lot of, uh, shame and guilt and self-loathing and anger and secrets and remorse. I mean, I just, that was what my life was about. And I didn't find drinking right away. I don't know how I survived it. I'm telling you, I was so crazy. I was so crazy. When I was 19, I met a guy and married him. And uh, he lived in South Carolina. And all I knew was that that was a long ways from Montana. And I just wanted to go as far away as I could from this way that I lived and this family that I had and make a life that was different for me than, than it had been for them. And and uh, we moved to Charleston, South Carolina. And we had five kids in six years and three months right away. And I was very busy. I had a lot of things going on. I had a lot of responsibility. And I was a young, terrified woman with no Nothing inside of me, no resources, no way to know how to be a mother or a wife. Um, I just, I just, I don't know. I just, I was trying to make a life that, uh, that was minus the way it had been at home. You know, I didn't want the, the violence or the abuse. Uh, it was really nasty in my house. It was really, really difficult. There was every form of abuse that we bring into alcoholic homes was the way I grew up. And and so when I left that, I just wanted to make it completely different. But I didn't really know how to do that. And there's this one little story that I tell that I call my snapshot. This is a, just a little picture of what I had going for me, for answers. When I was a kid, I lived out in the country, and my mom used to buy her eggs from the guy that lived down the road that had a whole bunch of chickens. And so in our house, when the egg cartons were empty, you didn't throw them away. You put them on top of the refrigerator. And when she had four, whatever, five, she would take them down the road and buy the eggs, and they'd use the same egg cartons. You know, you get the idea. Well, I didn't think about this. All I knew was that, you know, in our house, when the egg, par egg cartons are empty, you don't throw them away. And I was married. I was living in South Carolina. I'd been there about six months. And I had this big stack of egg cartons on top of the refrigerator. And one day my husband said to me, what are you saving these for? And I was like, I don't know. That's where they go, you know. That's, that's what you're supposed to do with them. I mean, I, it didn't occur to me that I should think, like, you know, do I want to model my life after my parents' life? Or, you know, did my parents' life work for them? Or do I know anybody that has any chickens? I mean, I didn't, I didn't think about this. I just knew that when you're a grown up, this is what you do, you know, and that's what I was trying to do. And that's not a good way to try to raise a family and be a wife, you know. I was extremely depressed and extremely, um, without any solution in my life. I was very suicidal, and about every six months I was on the phone to suicide prevention. I was just freaking out. I had way more responsibility than somebody like me should have, and no answers. And when I was uh, 27 years old, to make just like this, get through this really quick, I uh, discovered magic in my life, but I don't know how I lived to that extent. I mean, I, I had a philosophy in life. I thought that if I could find some way to be good, uh, that God would help me. And that, um, you know, bad things would stop happening in my life and I would be protected and safe. And I, I don't know why I thought that, but that's really what I thought. And so that was my entire motivation in life up until the age of 27. And when I was 27, my husband left. My oldest child was six, six years old and my youngest was nine months old. There were five of them. And he left. And I wasn't, you know, really particularly tore up about that. I was kind of glad to see him go. And uh, I went to work in the cowboy bars. And I'll tell you beyond a doubt that within the first couple of months of beginning to drink on a daily basis, beginning to party with people and, and live in that kind of environment, what I found very clearly was a power greater than myself that made my life work for me for the first time. And I needed the relief that I got from alcohol so bad. And I'm telling you that, you know, when I could put booze in me, I didn't have to be that scared little kid from Billings, Montana that didn't know what other people knew. And I didn't have to have the secrets and I didn't have to have the, the guilt and the shame and the fear and the remorse and the self-loathing and those things that I walked around that was the whole of me. Um, I could just, I don't know, somehow I just sort of made it fade back into the background. You know, it didn't really change anything about about the facts of my life, it just made it not as eminent, you know. There was a man I used to drink with in Red Lodge all the time, and he used to say, let's get drunk and be somebody. And I always said, let's get drunk and be somebody else. And that is exactly what makes me an alcoholic to me. That's in my opinion. That's what exactly what gives me the disease that what gave me, what made the disease of alcoholism so important in my life. You know, there's a place in the big book. 
um, it's page 33, it says something to the effect that uh, many of us don't have to drink the length of time or take the amount that others do, and it says that this is particularly true with women. It says that we often become the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few short years. And that, in a, you know, a couple of sentences is the basic, that's my whole story there. I mean, I was a disastrous drinker from the gate. It wasn't good. It was relief. That's what it was, was it gave me the ability to take a deep breath for the first time in my life. You know, it gave me the ability to just, like, it made the things that hurt me so much and scared me so much just kind of fade away, and I could be somebody else. And that was a freedom that I needed. You know, alcohol made me happy, joyous, and free for the first time. And alcohol controlled every aspect of my life. It truly was a power greater than me. But I wasn't really very good at it. I mean, I was a blackout drinker, and I was forever getting in trouble and, you know, shooting off my mouth and just, you know, I just, I hated, I hated my life before I found booze. And um, I learned to tolerate some really intolerable things <laughs> when I found booze because it gave me something that I needed, you know. But I mean, a blackout drinker, there's just nothing more annoying than... Um, Hearing those words, you know, don't you remember what you did last night? I just hate that. I mean, that's, oh, it just gets to be so tedious. And they're always telling you these horrible things, these stupid, ridiculous, embarrassing things. I mean, they're never anything good. It's never nice. It's, you know, it's always, I can remember standing there saying, geez, you know, I, I don't even think that about your husband. I, I'm, I'm sorry. And, you know, people just, people just don't understand. They, but it was the only thing that I had, you know, and, uh, and I was willing to do anything to get the relief that I got from drinking. And I did. I just basically turned my life over. It was a, it was a, I was a single mother at this point, and I figured I'm not doing anything that, you know, to anybody but myself. And, um, you know, I just did whatever I wanted. At the age of 27, I was so sick of trying to be good. And I, you know, had never been very successful at it. And so I just decided I was going to be bad, you know, and I know how to be bad. And, and I just, you know, you have to, there's something inside of you that you just have to turn off that you tell yourself you don't care anymore. And I just didn't. I didn't. I was just so sick of life. Life was a bad deal. And I was mad at God. I figured that, you know, somebody had been asleep at the switch in a major way in my life. And uh, it had to be God, you know, because he's supposed to be in control of things. And my life was crap. And, uh, you know, alcohol made, made that tolerable for me and I just uh, you know that's that's the entirety of my drinking story I have funny stories I had you know I had some fun times drinking I had some great times drinking um, but the reality of it is and the thing that I want to tell and the thing that I like to remember is that alcohol took me places I didn't want to go doing things that I didn't want to do with people I didn't want to know and being very concerned about what they were going to think of me you know um, the people that I love, my children, my, the, you know, alcoholism is an ugly disease and it destroys the lives of people that don't even have it. And that's exactly what happened. That's the reality of my drinking is that it took from me everything that was important to me. It melted away anything that might have been good or worthwhile about my life. And, uh, you know, I just, I was a drunk. I was a drunk and I had to have it to live. Um, I am a mother that if I was trying to raise my kids today, you know, CPS would be knocking at my door. Uh, CPS wasn't a big deal when, when I was doing what I was doing, and I don't know whether that's good or bad. I just know that's the way it was. But I am a parent um, that neglected and abused and loved and nurtured my children all at once. You know, I'm the kind of drunk who could walk in the door and wrap my arms around them and tell them how beautiful and wonderful they were and how smart they were and how much they meant to me, and it was true. Or the next day I could walk in and scream my head off because the dish rag was in the wrong place beside the sink. And it never had anything to do with them. It had to do with me. It had to do with what, what I was doing and the choices I was making. But uh, my kids suffered that, and that's a legacy that I've passed on, you know. It's a legacy that's been passed on by my disease. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a, a life where I have been allowed to um, create a new history. Really, I, I can't say I outgrew those things or that I made up for it. Believe me, I tried. I mean, if you, if you had anybody in your life that you've ever loved, I mean, my God, we would bleed to you know, uh, make up for the things that we did. But the truth is you really can't. You can't. It's a done deal. It's happened. Um, but the truth is I've been able to outlive it maybe. I've been able to live long enough now as a sober woman by principles that I learned here 
um, by behaviors and things I wanted to do and things I didn't want to do that have allowed me to create a completely different relationship with my children today. And that has been, is a treasure beyond words. It's also the same way with my parents. You know, my parents were abusive and, um, you know, I came from a home where there was a lot of violence and guns going off and a lot of beatings and a lot of all of the ugly things that can happen were happening in our home. Uh, today, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have learned to focus more on what kind of daughter I am to my mother and father rather than what kind of parents they were to me. And the truth is, it's given me some freedom. It doesn't change the fact that some of those things happen, and it doesn't change the fact that it has imprinted me, For you know, certainly. I, there are parts of me that have had to heal uh, and are in the process of healing that are kind of a legacy of what was passed on to me. But Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a way to go where I've been able to outgrow some of those things. And I know that there are places in my life that have been touched and healed that would have never, never happened if I hadn't come to AA and learned to do these steps and live by other principles. And today I'm, I'm a good daughter. You know, I'm a good daughter. I'm, I've learned the simple things. You know, like when I talk to my mother or my father, I look at them when I talk to them. And I look at them when they talk to me. And I'm courteous to them. And I am, uh, you know, I've learned to keep it light and polite. You know, I've learned, I've learned some wonderful tools that have allowed me to build a relationship with them that is great. I'm no longer the adversary and they are no longer my alibi. Uh, though it was certainly that way when I came to AA. I thought for sure that my life was the way it was because of the way I had lived and the things that had happened to me, but that wasn't the case. Um, at any rate, those are a couple of the great blessings that have happened for me. The relationship that I have with my kids today and the relationship I have with my parents mean a great deal to me. And, of course, those that type of relationship spills over into all the other relationships that I have, and I'm just really, really grateful for that. I don't struggle a lot today in those areas, and that's, Believe me, I struggled a lot for a lot of years, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I was a disastrous drunk. I was a blackout drinker. I, w I drank every day. I just I was a sleazy little drunk. I was just forever doing stuff I didn't want to do and ending up in bad situations and, you know, um, disappointing the people that I loved and the people that loved me very much time and time and time again. And that's just the reality of it. You know, I'm not going to make it sound like anything other than what it was. It was lousy. And... Uh, at the end, uh, I came to AA for the first time in February of 1981. I was living with a guy that was a drummer in a country rock band. And we woke up one morning and he said those words to me, you know, don't you remember what you did last night? You know, I mean, I hate it. If you're a blackout drinker, you know what that's like. You wake up in the morning and you get up and go, hey, good morning. How's it going? And, and everybody's very quiet and weird. You know, well, what's wrong? You know, God, don't you know what you did? You know, anyway, he said that to me. He said, don't you remember what you did last night? And I said, no. And he told me and he said, man, you have got to do something about your drinking. Now, this guy was not exactly a pillar of the community and um you know i resented that deeply but you know how we are i needed him i wanted him to stick around and so i was willing to do whatever he asked me to do and he said to me why don't you go to aa and i owe this guy my life probably you know um I'd never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd never heard of AA. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what, you know, I mean, he told me it was Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember thinking, I mean, in my wildest imaginings, I didn't expect to find people who were not drinking. I expected to find people who were trying not to drink because that's, you know, what I was doing was trying not to drink. And, and uh, so I just said, okay, I'll go to AA, you know. And I went to my first AA meeting. I got all dressed up to go see the drunks. And I went... <laughs> I went in, you know, I got my best pair of 501s and my boots and my fancy sweater on, and I walk into this place, and it was a very fluke meeting. There was um, there were about six people that were the core members of the Red Lodge AA group. Uh, but this particular night, the first time I ever walked into the doors, there must have been 30, 35 people there, and I didn't know a one of them. And I was like, whoa, where did all these people come from? I mean, I knew every drunk in town, I thought, you know. And... Um, it turns out it was some sort of, it was, they had it, this it never happened again. It never, ever happened again. But they had some kind of an anniversary or a birthday meeting or something. And people from all these little towns around the area had come for this particular night, you know. And I didn't know. I'm walking into my first meeting. And they all went around the room and said their names and that they were alcoholic. And I'm a good little chameleon. You know, I can blend right in no matter what's going on. So it came to me and I said my name and that I was an alcoholic. And I didn't know what an alcoholic was. And I, I didn't know that I was. I knew that I had trouble with drinking. And I was willing to, you know, blend in. I mean, I'm just, that's a, 
one of the legacies that was passed on to me in my childhood. I mean, you can throw me in the middle of, uh, you know, the Republican vegetarians and I blend right in. And you, I can hang out with the bikers and the rednecks and I blend right in. And you bet I'm there, you know. And uh, I had no opinions of my own. I had no perspectives of my own. I just wanted to cut my losses and not get hurt. And so I knew how to blend in. And that's what I did in AA. And I want to tell you that there's a few new people here this morning. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you can die doing that. You can die doing that. I came in here and I read how it works and I tried to look like you look and dress like you dress and talk like you talk and I learned all those sayings and, um, you know, nothing changed. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible way to live. I didn't, I totally didn't get it. You know, I came in here and there's like, nice looking people around, you know, and they, they were obviously, there were like three women that were the core members of this group in Red Lodge. And they were probably like a hundred, you know, they were <laughs> old, uh, you know, the, in honest truth, they were probably about the age I am now, but I looked at them and went, yeah, right. And, uh, you know, they, you could tell by looking at them that they were nice people. They were, they matched. They had like their little hair done and their nails were done and they had bright, clean faces, and they were smiling, and they liked each other, and they obviously liked being there, which I thought was weird, and, you know, they, you know, but you could tell by looking at them that they were nice people, and I wasn't a nice person, and I hadn't met a nice person in a long time, and I looked at them, and I thought there is, you know, I made an estimation, and I, my estimation was that I thought there's just no way that, that you're a drunk like I'm a drunk, because it wasn't the same, you know, it wasn't the same, and I didn't relate. I knew that I needed to be there. I needed to be there to keep him, and I needed to be there to get the kids off my back. But, but I didn't relate, and I stayed in. I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't tell anybody. You know, there's phrases you hear around here. Uh, one of the things that you hear once in a while in a meeting is that people talk about being as sick as your secrets. And I would listen to that, and I thought that they meant, oh, now I'm going to have to tell you all these really disgusting things that happened to me or that I did. You know, and there's a, there's another way to look at that though. There is. Um, you know, I didn't know that I was supposed to find somebody and go to them and say things to them like, you know, I have so much fear at night that sometimes I can't even sleep. I feel like my heart is just going to explode. It's just going to come right out of my chest. And I, I lay there at night and I worry about all kinds of weird stuff that's happening. And I've just got so much anxiety that I, I can't relax. You know, I didn't know I was supposed to tell somebody that stuff. And if you tell somebody that you're afraid or you tell somebody that you can't sleep, they have solutions for those things. Those are living solutions. And, uh, you know, but, but I didn't do that. They, I came into meetings and they said, how are you? And I said, fine. You know, I didn't tell them what was going on with me. I didn't tell them that I had so much shame and guilt that when I laid there at night, all I could see was the things that I had done and the disappointment in my kids' faces, you know, and that I was still lying. I was still trying to make it okay. I was still trying to assure them and assure me that it was going to be okay. Um, I didn't tell them the truth. And it was a long time before I got to the point where I could tell the truth in an AA meeting. I had to get really, really, really desperate first. So I bounced in and out of AA for almost seven years. And I would come in here every time I was sick and in trouble. And, uh, you know, it was really bad all over again. And I knew exactly what they meant when they said to me, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I mean, every time I would get to that place, there was something that would resurrect its head inside of me. And I would drag myself into AA one more time. And I would always come in here with lots of firm resolve. I would come in here and say, you know, you are going to get it together. You are not going to live like this. You know, you just can't do this. And, um, and I would give it a try, man. I would try with everything that I had. And I tell you what, if, you know, for the new people here today, they're wanting to be sober. If wanting to be sober was enough for us to get and stay sober, this room would not hold the people. This room wouldn't begin to hold the people that have come even just to this conference. The most sincere desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail at some point. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't believe there's a newcomer that hits the doors of, the, of, the, of Alcoholics Anonymous that doesn't want to be sober in some way or another. And I did. I wanted to be sober. I don't know that I was willing to do what I had to do to make that happen. I didn't know what I had to do to make that happen. I just wanted to not be noticed and uh, just get by, you know, just make it nice, make everything okay. And so uh, it didn't work. And every time for me, the same thing would happen. I would get to a point a couple weeks or you know, a month or two months or whatever into sobriety. And I would just, I couldn't stand to be sober one more minute. I mean, everything that I ran from, all of the guilt and the fear and the shame and the self-loathing and the secrets and the anger, 
All of that stuff was huge. And I would get to a place where I had to have some relief and I would tell myself, I'm just going to drink tonight and tomorrow, tomorrow I'll go back into AA and I'll try really, really, really hard. But I just, I couldn't stand it one more second. And, uh, you know, the good news is that there's, there are solutions in Alcoholics Anonymous that, that will provide that. But I didn't know that. I thought it was about not drinking. So uh, it took me out a lot of times. I probably had to raise my hand to the newcomer maybe 30 times in an AA meeting. It gets to be very tedious. It gets to be, you know, really humiliating. Um, at one point, a few years into it, I ended up, I did, I'd lost my kids because of my drinking. They went to their dad and said, you know, mom's going to kill herself and we don't, we don't know what to do for her and she needs help. And so he said, well, you're just going to stay here with me. And he sort of intervened, you know, he, he called me up and he said, they're not coming back and you need to get your act together. And I have to tell you the truth that day, I hadn't had a drink in five weeks. So if drinking was my problem, I should have been like at least on the road to being better by then. But drinking was not my problem. I was insane. I was insane. When I didn't drink, it was worse. And um, I knew I was in trouble, and I was really trying hard not to drink. And, and I, had, I hadn't had a drink in five weeks. And they went to him and said, Mom is nuts, and she's going to kill herself. And so he kept them, and then I really tried. I mean, I wanted those kids back in my life more than anything in the world. I needed them. They are the only thing in my life that was good. They were the only thing that kept me on earth, you know, and I wanted them in my life and I needed them and I loved them. And even with the, with that, I couldn't not drink. Um, it, my love for them and my regard for them wasn't enough to, you know, it would just couldn't do it. But I really, really threw my shoulder into it then. And for two more years, I, I tried not to drink, you know, and it just, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, I did a geographic about in the middle of this uh, time. At one point, I had a friend who had moved to Kona, Hawaii, and um, I went over there to go to work, and, uh, you know, I was sober. I went over there sober. I had about six months sober, and I'm all in control, you know. Got it covered. i am got the plan. I'm going to go over there and get a couple jobs, make a whole bunch of money, and then I'll move home and get the kids back. Everything will be great. And um, I figured in my the back of my head that if I could ever get a year which was impossible for me, but if I could ever get a year of sobriety, that it would be, that would be, maybe I'd gain some momentum or something and it would get easier, or whatever. So I was just hanging on for grim death, you know, and I got the year. I went over to Kona, I went to work. It's a beautiful place. And I went to meetings, did the same thing there I did in home, you know. Uh, I didn't tell anybody about what was going on. I didn't, uh, I just did what you do. I read how it works. I pour coffee. I, how are you? I'm fine. And uh, I was over there about a year. I invited my daughter over, and we did her 16th birthday there, and I had the whole thing all planned. And we did this great 10 days on the island and just had a blast. And then at the end, I said, okay, Trina, you know, I'm going to come home, and I'm going to get a house, and we're going to – everybody will move back in. And she said, no, Mom, we don't want to live with you. You know, we're not, we're not going to come home. And it's just – it's like I lost what I was staying sober for, you know. And she left, and it was about two more weeks before I drank again. I just couldn't handle – I couldn't handle it. And um, then it got really annoying. You know, in Kona, they do this thing. If they say, is there anybody here for their first, second, or third meeting since their last drink? And then everybody would look at me to see if I'm going to raise my hand today. I mean, it was – Oh, it got, I knew people over there that I swear to you, they didn't have two brain cells to rub together and they were staying sober. And I couldn't understand this. You know, I am a bright woman and I couldn't do this for anything. And it was just so annoying. They obviously liked being here. They liked each other. There was something they enjoyed about this whole thing. And it just, I hated it. I hated it. And I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And I couldn't understand how to, how to do this. And I was in an AA meeting one night, and this is what happened for me. I was, uh, this guy said uh, at the end of the meeting, he asked if there was anybody that had a burning desire, and I don't know why. I mean, I guess maybe I sort of felt like, you know, let's just get it on here. I mean, I, you're either going to throw me out of here or tell me what you're doing, <laughs> but I can't stand it, you know. And so I raised my hand, and I said, yeah, I got a burning desire for you. I said, uh, you know, you people just make me sick. I said, <laughs> You're always telling me that sober is better, and sober doesn't feel better to me, man. I hate this. I just like, bleh, you know. And I, I had this feeling of like, you know, let's do it. Throw me out of here. Or tell me what you're doing, you know. And um, after I shut up, there was this kind of weird silence for a minute. And then somebody went, right on, Donna. Keep coming back. You know? I said, God, you people are weird. Um, 
there was just so many things about AA I didn't get, but back in Billings, I used to go to Billings meetings a lot, and there was this uh, tall, skinny cowboy that always dressed in black, and he always had some kind of manure on his boots and a big water Copenhagen in his lip, you know. He was always saying things that totally, oh, used to just get on my nerves so bad. I remember he would say things like, you know, when it comes to pain and sobriety, sometimes you just have to be like a mule in the hailstorm. You just have to hunker down and take it. And I remember thinking, you know, I was hoping for more than that. <laughs> I mean, that's not a big consolation to me. And he was the first guy that I ever heard say that uh, when it came to drinking, he was like the tomcat making love to the skunk. He hadn't had all he wanted, but he had all he could stand. <laughs> I thought, geez, where do you get these people, you know? But anyway, it was the same kind of thing in Kona, and I was just angry, you know. And after I finally said the truth that night, this guy came up to me, and I had been just stringing as many days together as I could before I drank, and I knew that I would drink again because I always had. Uh, I wasn't even hoping to get sober anymore. I was just going to plug it as many days as I could. And uh, he came up to me after the meeting, and he, sa I said, you know, I don't know why this program won't work for me, but it just won't work. And he said, uh, well, how long has it been since you've had a drink? And I said, 45 days. And it was just like, ugh, all I could stand. And he said, uh, well, what makes you think it isn't working? <laughs> I said, because I hate this. I mean, you obviously like being here. I was like nails on a chalkboard to me. I can't, you know, stand it. And and he showed me a line in the 12 and 12 in one one sentence in the seventh step. And it says, in every case, pain had been the price of admission into a new life. In every case. And I had a load of pain right then. And I remember thinking that maybe what was happening wasn't for nothing. And, you know, it just sort of bought me one more day is all. What happened for me was God did something for me that I couldn't do for myself. And this is how it happened. I went to our Saturday night meeting that night. And there was this woman that was there for a month's vacation after her husband had just died. And she was from California. She was from Paso Robles, California. And she was about 27 years sober. She was awesome. This lady was absolutely awesome. She was, for one thing, she was gorgeous. She was uh, about, she must have been close to 70, but she had this big Janice Joplin hair, and she tied it up. It was like all salt and pepper gray, and she uh, tied it up in big silk scarves, and she wore a bunch of jewelry, and she just lit up the room, you know? This was somebody that loved being an AA, and she loved being an AA woman, and she just, you know, loved Alcoholics Anonymous, and there was something about her. I mean, there was a magic about her. And she stood up at the podium that night, and she told her story. And, you know, when she told her story, she said things that I understood. Um, you know, you could say that she told my story, except that just like Bobby was talking about last night, if you didn't have the same, you know, if you hadn't drank in the snag bar in Red Lodge, Montana, and had five kids, I didn't relate, you know. Well, it was the same thing with Phyllis. She had two kids. I had five kids. She was a sleazy little drunk, though, but she was a jet setter. She was like, you know, I was drinking in these cowboy bars in Montana, and she was running around the world drinking in these high-class places. But but it was, I'll tell you what, what was the same was that she talked about the the feelings of guilt and shame and fear and self-loathing. She talked about the secrets. She talked about those things, and I knew exactly. I knew exactly what she meant, and I knew that she knew about me. I knew that she wasn't going to be uh, shocked at anything I would tell her. She was. She knew that she was talking my language, you know. And uh, she was. I remember that she was 36 when she got sober. And I was 36 then, and I remember thinking, man, if there was just some way that I could not drink, maybe I could be, I could have some of that someday. I could be like that or have some of that kind of thing in, in her life. She was incredible. She got this, she had this special gift that you develop after you've been around AA for a while. She could like look around the room and pick out the sickest woman there and go right for her, you know? And, uh, she came up and put her arm around me and she said, sweetheart, you just stay by me and everything's going to be okay. And I'll tell you, I just melted. I just melted. This lady was incredible. I just loved her to pieces. Um, I remember that she said to me, you know, if I had a daughter, she'd be just like you. She'd be really sick. And, <laughs> and I thought that that meant that she liked me, you know, so I thought that was really cool. Um, I spent every minute that I could with Phyllis, and the deal that this is what she gave me. One day we were sitting on the beach, and I said, you know, Phyllis, I probably need to do another fourth step, right? And she said, no, sweetheart, you just need to do a first step, that's all. And I said, you know, I don't know what you mean. I mean, how do you do a first step? I mean, what does that mean? I know I'm an alcoholic. And she said that there's implied action in the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said that it says that we are powerless over alcohol and that our lives are unmanageable. And she said the implied action there is that you need to find new management. 
She said, you need to find a power greater than you are that will solve your problem. And I said, okay, you know, what do I do? And she said, well, tell me about your higher power. What kind of higher power do you have? So I started telling her about the churches I'd been to when I was a kid and stuff that I thought I knew about God. And she stopped me in the middle of that explanation. And she said, let me tell you something. She said, any God that you can understand will be too small for your needs. And I'd never heard anybody say anything like that in my life. I mean, I was like, whoa, you know, what do you mean? And she said, you know, how long have you been trying to get sober? I was like, well, seven years. And she said, it's not working. She said, you need to be willing to consider something else. And I'm like, I'm really lost. I said, like what? And she said, well, let me tell you this. She said, when you lay down at night and you go to sleep, your lungs inflate and deflate all night long and your heart beats all night long. And there's nothing that you do before you go to bed that is going to make that happen all night. And I said, yeah. And she said, when your time on this earth is up, there is nothing that you could do to add one more minute to your time on this planet. When your time is up, you're gone. And I said, yeah. She said, well, that is a power greater than yourself. She said, that's something you didn't create, and it's something you can't control. And she said, if you wake up in the morning and you're breathing, then you are a spiritual being, and God loves you as if you were his only child. I mean, it was just amazing. I remember exactly what she said. I didn't understand what it meant. You know, I said, well, you know, don't I need to know who God is? Don't I need to know who I'm going to turn my life and my will over to? And she said, no. She said, it's none of your business who God is. She said, God knows who he is. If you if you talk to him, he'll answer you. And I said, well, what do I call him? And she plays it like real straight. She goes, well, you could call him God, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was just so simple. And I said, well, what do I do? And she said, when you're alone tonight, I want you to get on your knees and say this prayer. And she said, you make it, put it in your own words. Say it however you want to say it. But the basic idea you want to put out there is something like, God, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you want from me. But if you want anything to do with what's left of my life, then come on, because I don't know where to go from here. And I tell you what, I thought about this a lot. And I remember thinking, you know, first of all, when she said God loved me as if I were his only child, I remember thinking, if I could find a higher power that loved me half as much as I love my kids, I bet that would be enough for me. I bet it would do it. And then I remember that she said, uh, you know, that she said, my spirituality is a done deal. She said, it's a given. It's not something you need to create. It's something that already is. She said, whatever the difference between a live body and a dead body is, that's something special. That's some, that contains you. And she said, if you ever wake up and you're not breathing, you won't be here. So don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> she said, that is an essence that is something that can't be created in any other way. So that is evidence that there is a power larger than you. You know, it made sense to me. And I remember, you know, I went back into the meetings in Kona and I told everybody that I had a new higher power and it was my breath. And they all just said, that's great. Just keep coming back. Um, but the tr I'm serious about it. I mean, I thought when I, this is the thing. I thought, you know, when I opened my mouth and I inhaled to pray, I could feel the air on the back of my tongue. And it was the first time ever in my life that I had ever looked within to find a place of peace, ever. I had always been praying to some God out there somewhere that may or may not help me, depending on if I was good. You know, I had some old ideas that I didn't know were old ideas. And one of the things that I struggled with is I remember when I was about eight, my mom used to send us to church. And, you know, I, I don't fault church. I mean, I don't know what they said. I know what I heard with my little alcoholic filter, you know. I, um, what they told me was things like, you know, when I was born on this earth, I wasn't born this beautiful, innocent little child. When I was born on this earth, I was born with all the sins of the world on me for all time. And that is, you know, kind of a stacked deck, if you ask me. I mean, that's that's hard to get out from under, you know. And I'd spent my whole life trying to get out from under this legacy that, that happened to me when I drew breath. And they said, you know, things like, if you've thought it, you've done it. And I thought a lot. I was always thinking, you know. And uh, I just could never be good enough. And I don't know where I got the idea that God would help me if I was good. They said, you know, God is good and God is love. And so I thought that if you were going to live a spiritual life that you had to be good, that you didn't sin, you didn't, you know, you didn't do things wrong. You had to be good. And so my effort was to be as good as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I can do that for just a little while, but then I'm going to be bad. You know, I just do. I'm going to say something I shouldn't say or do something I shouldn't do. And 
Now that I've been bad, God's not going to help me. And that was the whole mindset that I had. And, uh, you know, I, I was shooting myself in the foot. You know, and Phyllis said that I didn't have to earn this. She said, if you wake up and you're breathing, that it's already a done deal. You know, there's a place in the big book that says that deep within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. And it says that in the final analysis, it is only there that he may be found. And that is what happened for me. You know, when I, today, I believe, and this is, this is my opinion, that when they talk about God as you understand him, they're not talking about God as you comprehend him. They're talking about God as you recognize him. And when I, you know, when I go within to that place of peace within me that is my source, there's never any confusion for me. I don't struggle anymore with what is God's will for my life, you know. I believe I know what God's will for my life is. I mean, I don't know what God's will is for the, from now to the end of my life, but I know what God's will is for me today. God's will for me today is to be sober, because first of all, if I'm not sober, I will never survive the conditions of my life. There's too much loss, there's too much sadness, there's too much pain, it's just too difficult. And now that I'm sober, my job, my responsibility is to be as loving as I can and as kind as I can and as supportive as I can to whoever it is that walks through my world today. I mean, it's not just in AA meetings. You know, I have to carry this into all of the areas of my affairs, everything. I, wa I li try to live these principles. I mean, I'm not perfect. I have lots of character defects. I don't even mind anymore. You know, it's what keeps me needing God. It's what keeps me needing the principles of this program. Um, it's, it's my obligation to be the best person I can. And it's a very wonderful way to live when you just try to practice Love and kindness, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great way to live. There's not a lot of pressure involved in that. Um, it's a lot of freedom. And I just believe that that's what God's will is for me. You know, God is using me and as long as He's using me, I'm gonna be here. And the day that comes that I'm no longer breathing, I won't be here and I don't know where I'll go and I don't care. But the way I live today is I don't live for what's gonna happen to me later. I live today for today. This is the only day that I have. And, uh, you know, that's what I've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous, that and a thousand, thousand, thousand other things. Um, that was the beginning of my sobriety. When I said that prayer, when I said, God, you know, I, I don't know what you, what you want from me, and I don't know who you are, but if you want to do the deal, then let's do the deal, because I'm out of answers. Um, what happened for me is that I, I, number one, I haven't had to take a drink or uh, smoke any dope or take any pills or do any anything really bizarre for a long time, you know. Um, it was the beginning of my sobriety. It was the beginning of a connection to something larger than me. And it was the beginning of, of introduction to a set of principles that work so well. Um, I have to tell you that, you know, Phyllis talked to me about a lot of stuff. She talked to me about surrender, and she talked to me about relationships, and she gave me some guidelines along those things, and they've been incredible. And I truly have modeled my sobriety after the things that she taught me, and if it hasn't stayed with that. It's grown a lot, you know. The way I live today is very different from the way I lived then, and my connection to my higher power is very different from the way it was in the beginning. But it was it was enough to effectuate the beginning of, of recovery for me. It was enough to begin sobriety. And uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. I'm so grateful that she gave me an explanation like that because it was separate from my, it was logical. It was logical to me. And it was separate from from the arguments that I'd always made, you know, for or against what living a spiritual life was like. Um, <clears throat> it was shortly after uh, I had this spiritual experience that I met God's will for my life in an AA meeting, you know. <laughs> and uh, I talked to my husband this morning, and he said, make sure you tell him how wonderful your husband is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was uh, I was in an AA meeting, and I truly was on a different plane, but I was new, 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 new again. I had just a few weeks of sobriety, you know, and... Um, I met my husband in an AA meeting, and he had 17 years of sobriety, and it was uh, certainly a dubious foundation for a relationship, to say the very least. But, um, you know, I was just sure this is what I wanted, and I didn't come from sponsorship that said no uh, relationships in the first year. I didn't get any of those opinions. What I was told is that relationships are the most growing thing you'll ever do in your life. And if you can learn to practice these principles in your home, you won't have any trouble practicing it out there. And I'm not saying it's a great idea. You know, I mean, I've had a lot of sponsors who've come up to me and said, don't tell that. You know, I don't need my newcomers to hear about this thing. But that's just the way it was for me. That's what they told me. They encouraged me to live my life. They didn't tell me how to live it. Um, they encouraged me to live by the principles. So Terry and I got together and 
we're going to trudge the road to happy destiny, you know. And I'll tell you what, I uh, I sat back for a long time and watched the way he did things. And I uh, we went to a lot of meetings, and our relationship was based on our mutual commitment in meetings. That's just the way it was. Um, when we got ready to get married, uh, we had agreed that I, we wouldn't get married until I had a year, you know. And so we had a, I had about 15 months, and we I was, like, real ready for this, you know. I'm like, let's get married. And, you know, I'm thinking I got long-term sobriety here, not a problem, you know. And he had about, I don't know, 18, 19 years then. He had a little more to lose than I did, and he was a little nervous about this. But um, it was time for us to make this commitment. And I remember what happened is right before we got married, he said to me, let me tell you what the rules are. Well, I didn't like the sound of that very much. <laughs> but, you know, I said, okay, what? What are the rules? And this is exactly the way he said it to me. He said, if I ever pick up a drink, I want you to promise me that you'll get as far away from me as fast as you can, because if you don't, I'll take you with me. And he said, I promise you that if you ever pick up a drink, that I will do the same. He said, our relationship is based on our mutual sobriety and on our commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if, if that foundation is ever broken, we would be fooling ourselves to believe that we could pick up where we left off and go on. Now, that's just for me. That's just for me. I got to tell you that there were times in the first couple of years of my sobriety when I may have been tempted to pick up a drink one more time. But I wasn't willing to put on the table what I knew had to go on the table. You know, I wasn't willing to put everything up there. And that is the reality of it. All I, all I know is that, you know, that alone is not enough to live by, but it bought some time. And AA has worked in my life, and the principles, the traditions have worked in my life, and my higher power has worked in my life. And we've been able to create a marriage that's just incredible. Uh, we just celebrated 13 years of marriage in, uh, in July, and i got to tell you that my husband is my dearest, dearest friend. This, this man is, uh, the, the, the thing I love about him probably the most is that he is the same guy at 6 o'clock in the morning when he gets out of bed and there's nobody there to see him but me, that he is in the meeting at night. He is the same man. There's no AA face there. He doesn't pretend to be any kind of thing. He's going to be 31 years sober the 25th of this month, you know, and he's uh, the greeter at our home group. And when you go to our home group, you are officially greeted, let me tell you. And uh, he has more joy and enthusiasm in his life than anybody I know. He is the, he's the biggest five-year-old I've ever lived with, and he's absolutely a delight. We live in a home. I wish you could come and see the way we live. Uh, we live in a home. We wake up in the morning, and there's, not, there's nice talk. There's friendly talk, and we're interested in each other, and we enjoy each other, and we have a lot of fun. And that isn't to say we haven't had some difficulties, you know. Rebuilding my relationship with my children, I'm just going to wrap it up here, and, you know, I'm out of time this morning, and I appreciate your patience. But I wanted to share a couple of things that have happened. Uh, in the last few years, two of my kids have died. And it's been a very, very difficult, difficult, to say the least, time in our lives. You know, we were kind of trudging along and just sort of doing the best we could. And I'm trying to reestablish my relationship with my children. And it never occurred to me in my, my wildest dreams that they would ever be gone and that there would be no opportunity to rebuild that. But what happened was about six years ago, I, it had been five years since I'd seen my only son and my oldest daughter. And the others had kind of come back and kind of not. You know, uh, when I was two years sober, I got letters from all of them saying, we don't want to know you. You know, just leave this family alone. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, I wanted more than anything in the world to uh, have an opportunity to be the person that I know that I am. And, uh, you know, to make up for things. I did want to make up for things then. I know today that I can't do that, but that was what I wanted. And, um, you know, I was staying sober and doing everything AA asked me to do because I wanted that. I wanted that in my life. That was my condition to sobriety. And, um, you know, I'm thankful for the women that I knew in the desert that told me that uh, if I stayed here, they told me things like, you know, your kids are going to be adults longer than they're going to be kids. And they said, if you stay here and you do what AA asks you to do, if they ever want to know you, you'll have what it takes to walk through that. And if you stay here and stay sober and they never want to know you, you'll have a sober life. But they said, if you don't take care of this and you don't uh, maintain your sobriety, you're going to blow the last chance you ever had and you don't, you can't afford it. And I believed them, you know. So I just kept staying here, but there were lots and lots of surrenders. It was very painful. I was really angry. I was, you know, sit in meetings and hear pe about people putting their wonderful families back together, and I would think, you know, when am I going to get mine? And uh, there's a guy down in Southern California who likes to talk about 
after you've been sober a while, that, that many times we can start believing that we should be rewarded for having received this gift. And uh, the truth of the matter is I came here for sobriety and I've been given that, you know, and I thought that I was going to be happy, joyous and free and that bad things were going to stop happening. And that's just not the way life does things sometimes, you know, um, my second daughter, let's see, my oldest daughter and my son hadn't spoken to me in five years. My second daughter had left home and uh, hit the streets in Bakersfield, which if anybody has ever been to Bakersfield, it's not a nice place. And she was living on the streets in Bakersfield, and she was running around doing a lot of drugs, and it was just bad. And I remember that she would call me up and say, uh, I've been sleeping in the park, you know, and I haven't eaten in a couple of days, and I want to go back to Montana. And uh, I'd say, you know, give me your phone number. I'd hang up and I'd call my sponsor and like, oh my God, what do I do? You know, she would say, don't send her any money. She said, go get her, go get her, bring her home, feed her, bathe her, you know, pack a little bag and then send her to Montana if that's what she wants, but don't send her money. So I'd call Tracy back and say, okay, I'm going to be there in about three hours. You know, she'd say, well, let me call you back. And I wouldn't hear from her for six months. You know, I didn't know if she was dead or alive or what she was doing. It was just hard. It was really hard. And, it, you know, I thank God for AA. I thank God for the women who told me, you know, you're, you've are you got to do this. You can't get in God's way. She's finding her path. She's doing what she has to do. Well, she ended up uh, back down in the desert, and she ended up dead on arrival at uh, at uh, Desert Hospital, and they revived her from a drug overdose, and they stuck her in treatment at a place called The Ranch out in Desert Hot Springs. And that girl got sober. And that just blew my mind because, I mean, I, I'm in and out a hundred times, right? So I'm thinking she's trying sobriety for the first time. And little did I know she was never going to drink again forever um, for the rest of her life. Uh, so then that happened. And then my middle daughter sort of started doing the same kind of running around and drinking. And the youngest was talking to me and having something to do with me. But my oldest daughter and my son hadn't spoken to me in five years. And my sponsor, Polly, said, uh, you know, write them a letter and tell them that you welcome the opportunity to visit with them and that you'll be happy to answer their questions and that you look forward to when you can see them. But that if they don't want to see you, that you'll respect that, that you're not going to just show up. I sent the letter off and I got a phone call from Daniel and he said that he would see me and Trina said she'd see me too. Um, I went up to Montana to visit them and I'll tell you, you know, there's, uh, I learned some stuff. I learned some things that I didn't even know that AA had given me. And one of the biggest gifts that I think I'd been given is that, um, I had learned how to take responsibility without taking the blame. You know, Polly was really direct with me and she said, when you go talk to them, you don't, you don't make any excuses. You know, you don't say, well, you know, I did the best I could or I had a disease and, you know, if I could have done better, I would have done. She said, don't even go there. You know, she said, you just stand there and you listen to them. You answer their questions regardless of what they ask you, uh, to the best of your ability. And she said, you honor their experience. You say, yes, you're right. That's exactly the way it was and I will always regret it. You know, there's a place in the big book, I think it's on page 77 where it talks about amends and it says that we confess our former ill feelings and we express our regret. And she said, uh, you know, you've been sorry your whole life and saying you're sorry one more time isn't going to mean Jack. You know, I mean, you're going to have what you need to do is express your regret. And I have to tell you, there's something very empowering about that. It is uh, it's not shameful and it's not uh, it's not a put down. You know, I can say I will always regret that that's the way we lived. And my only hope is that if we can have enough days together that we can begin to create a new history, that you will get to know who I am because I'm not that woman anymore, and I will get to know who you are, because you're not the guy I knew anymore. Um, my son didn't didn't make it. You know, he, um, he was a new member of AA at that time. He was 18 years old, and we went to some meetings together, and I will always, always treasure the five days that we had. Um, it was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, it was not, you know, I was, I was real upset about, real angry about it for a long time because it didn't feel, seem like it was enough. But today I'm really grateful for it. Uh, I left Montana after spending some time with him and he started drinking again. Uh, he had 89 days and he started drinking and he made it about six months and he woke up one day. It was one month after his 19th birthday and he just said, I can't live like this anymore. And I've been to AA and it didn't work for me. And he, uh, he committed suicide. He jumped off a cliff. And, um, you know, I mean, he was so done. He was so done. I mean, he stood at that turning point. And I've been at that turning point a thousand times. And I don't know why I'm sober here today. I'm standing here and um, that I haven't had to drink and, and why he did, you know. I do know this, that there, I know, I, I've known a hundred people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are more spiritual than me. 
who uh, have more going on than I do, more talented, more wonderful, and they're dead today, you know. So I don't know why it is. I do know that my sobriety is a gift, and I treasure it, and I protect it with everything that I have because you just never know, you know. There's a place uh, in the big book that talks about uh, for if an alcoholic fails to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he can't survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. And uh, those are some low spots, you know. I'll tell you, if I had waited um, until it all hit the fan to, you know, to develop a spiritual life, I suppose it would have been too late. I've seen that happen for people that I've known, people that uh, I love a lot. And I'm, I'm blessed. I'm telling you, I'm blessed. I was lucky. I believed what they told me about your behavior in Alcoholics Anonymous is not discretionary. You have to stay here and you have to do this, whether you want to, whether you feel like it, whether it's convenient. I mean, trust me. AA is an extremely inconvenient lifestyle. I mean, <laughs> talk about inconvenience. I mean, you give your life. You give your life. We don't get to pick and choose here, you know. And I, I am so grateful that I was taught that and that I believed them. I don't know why I believed them, but I believed them. And uh, I formed this. This has been the basis for my living. It was um, two years and nine months after Daniel died that Tracy, my second daughter, the one who was sober, she just got sick and died. She uh she was five years sober, and she was married and had a little three-year-old, and she was an incredible woman. She was sponsoring people, very, very active in AA, very neat, energetic young woman, and uh, 27 years old. And she just she caught a virus, and it destroyed her heart, and she was gone before they could even diagnose it. And I'll tell you what, you know, this has been for me, it has been the most precious events of my life. I know how weird that sounds, but it's been the truth because it's been the absolute path by which I found a connection to a power greater than me that I didn't even believe was possible for somebody like me. You know, when Phyllis told me about the connection that I began 14 years ago, it was enough to begin. It was sort of like I, I, uh, I came to terms with a power greater than myself then. But through the period of these events, I have made peace with a power greater than myself. And I don't believe that God, you know, did these things so that I would find him. I don't believe that. I don't believe that, you know, people say God won't give you any more than you can handle. I don't believe that either. I just, uh, I believe that life happens. Life is this way. Life is this way. It is made up of every component to living. It is happy, joyous, and free, and it is horrible, painful, unfair, you know, really exhausting. I mean, it's everything. Life is all of the good and all of the bad. But God is there to walk me through it. And this I know for a fact. If I am living in Donna's world, all I can see is the pain and the loss and the regret and the uh, you know, and it gets to be wearing. It gets to be exhausting. But if I can live in God's world, even for just part of the day, what I see are the gifts that come from these events. And the gifts have been tremendous. I am not happy that these things happen, but I am forever happy that I, for the things that have happened to me because of them and for the life that I live today. You know, the people that are new here, when you are new in Alcoholics Anonymous, it is the most miserable time. I mean, believe me, you just think this cannot possibly be good, you know. Um, the worst, the worst, the most disappointing, the most, you know, problem-ridden times in life are going to, I promise you, you are going to look back on it and say, my God, what a wonderful, wonderful time. It is the best and the worst, but it is the gift. It is the vehicle. It is whatever it is that brings you to your knees that allows an opening of opportunity for things greater than you could imagine to be created in your life. And, uh, you know, if I haven't learned anything else, I've learned that life is a precious, precious gift. And life is very, very good. I love my life today. I would rather be me than any person I know. Anyone I know, even with it, even with it. And that is a tremendous blessing and a gift and a freedom to me. I mean, I don't live a life of sadness today. I live a life of joy. And I have to tell you, the, the best thing that I've gotten is that I feel safe for the first time in my life. And I don't know about you, but feeling safe means more to me than feeling love. Feeling safe means more to me than anything. And I feel safe in this world today. I live a life of purpose. I live a life that is wonderful, it is peaceful, and it is full of kindness. And I am so blessed, so blessed for my sobriety. I've talked too long. I'm going to finish with one quick little story. This is a story that I heard a man tell in Southern California about surrender. And um, he says the drunk goes to God and says, you know, I, I need to get sober. Will you please help me? And God says, what have you got? 
And the drunk says, well, I don't have anything. I pretty much tore it up out there. I got like, you know, I got like 50 bucks. And God says, okay, give me the 50 bucks. The drunk says, well, okay, but if I give you the 50 bucks, I won't be able to put any gas in my car. God says, oh, you got a car? (laughs) He says, yeah, I got a car. He says, okay, then give me the car and the 50 bucks. And the guy says, well, okay, but if I give you the car, how am I going to get to work? God says, oh, you have a job. He says, yeah, I have a job. Okay, then I want the job and the car and the 50 bucks. And he says, well, if I give you my job, you know, how am I going to pay rent on my house? God says, oh, you got a house, you know. He says, yeah. He says, okay, so I want your house. I want your job, your car, your 50 bucks. I want them all. You know, you give me everything. The guy says, you know, if I do that, I won't have any place for my family to live. And God says, you have a family? He said, then you give me your family. And you give me your car and your house and your job and your 50 bucks. You give me all of that, and I'll give you sobriety. Those are my terms. Take it or leave it. And the drunk says, I can't, I cannot live like this anymore. I mean, but I got to tell you, my family means everything to me. They are my life. And God says, that is what I'm asking you for. You give me your life. Now I'm going to give you back your life, but it's not going to be the way you recognize it. It's not going to be your life anymore. It's my life. And you are obligated to do what I ask you to do. And I'm going to give you the family back, but they're not your family anymore. They're my family. And I want you to treat these people with dignity and respect. I want you to look at them in the eye when you talk to them. I want you to treat them with kindness. I want you to be respectful to them. And I'm going to give you the job back, but it's not your job. It's my job. I want you to give your boss a little more than he pays you for. And I want you to remember coming in and going from work that you might be the only big book that somebody sees. And you have to conduct yourself in a, in, in a manner that is uh, principled principled living and I'm going to give you your money but it's not your money it's my money and there's things that need to be done you know there's panels that need to be met and there's uh, 12 step calls that need to be made and I need to have you available to me you know and that has helped me a lot in the deep in the depth of my despair there were many times when it helped me to remember that when I made that bargain with God and I said you know If you want anything to do with what's left of my life, then come on. That that is what I did. See, I made the bargain for all the marbles. I don't get to let God have part of my life and I work the rest of it. I have to give it all to God. And then I am willing to be of service in whatever way that he can use me. And as long as I can be of service, I have some purpose. You know, and I know that sounds like really big, uh, you know, ambitious way to live. But the truth is, it's very small. It's very small, really. And it's, uh, you know, living a spiritual life is profoundly practical. And it, it just is the smallest acts of kindness. I want to thank you for your patience with me this morning. Thank you for this weekend. And thanks for listening to me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.